you asked him pre-pandemic, he'd have said about yeah, 15 to 20 percent chance. So he, he moved it up, and that's because he's he's a believer that the Fed has to take some aggressive rate action. He was the first to call for, I think, seven rate rises in January, February. People thought he was crazy. Now the whole market came that way. So the idea is, why do they need to move that aggressively? Because inflation's real. It wasn't temporary. It's real. What? Well, but there's a good aspect to what's going on in America now, which is American consumers are very strong. So that presents a t challenge to the Fed, but it's also a good thing to be working against. Their they're leverage is in great shape. Their account balances have gone up very, very dramatically. Even the stimulus stopped in March of last year. The account balances of our, team, our, our customers at Bank of America have gone up every month since last June or July. Um, went up faster March to April than they did any other month. If you think about the ability to borrow, the credit card balance is still down from 100 billion to 80 billion. That means the same customers could go back and borrow the money. They're highly credit worthy. The, if you think about um, their spending, their spending in the month of May, the first two weeks is up 10% over last year. They're out doing things. Now it's shifted more to services, travel, Restaurants are strong. So May good. It, that's good. Hmm. May's good. Up 10% over last year. And by the way, that's overcoming the tax payments. If you remember last year, you could pay your taxes in May. Mm -hmm. A lot of people took advantage of that. So that's even overcoming that at 10%. Transaction volume at 8 or 9. All that's good. Now, there is a s different side to that. Actually, even when you look at our customers, receipts from their paychecks is up 8% year over year. In other words, that we can see, not Bank of America employees, but other, you can see their periodic payments come in. The good news is that that is a great place for America to be relative to the rest of the world, that strong consumer-led economy. Our consumer economy is as big as China's economy. You know, it's, it's, this is a very good thing. The tough thing is with low unemployment, wage growth, then the Fed's job is tougher, and that's a conundrum. So Michael has them slowing down the economy, gets slower in the second half, and then, you know, well, he hasn't announced 24, but my guess it'll start to come out of that. It doesn't go into recession uh, by his current prediction, but the probability went up. Mm -hmm. All right, so no recession this year, good thing. Maybe not next year, but is that a stagflationary environment? No, they've got, to, they've got to choke off inflation, and that may drive growth below a trend. So our predictions this year are 2.56, uh, next year 1.56, and that's been down. If I, you and I talk in January, that would have been probably 3.5. And, and so they've dropped a whole, you know, whole point plus off. And, and so that, that, that goes below trend, which means they've actually over, overshot slowing it down. And, and so his thesis is they'll get inflation under control. But again, that consumer is going to make it tougher and easier because, frankly, if people are employed and have money to spend, that means that the U.S. economy will continue to be strong, and that's not a bad thing. Brian, you're the only Bank of America CEO that I have known in my career, and I was thinking back last night on, on the crises and the things you've seen, the cycles you've seen. Are you confident that the Fed gets this right, this rate hiking cycle, yeah. they get it right, where they can raise rates, bring down inflation, and the economy still grows? So, so let's go to the, the other case. What if they don't? What if we go into recession? Most people even say, if you look at the blue chip economists, none, none of them have a recession in the next two, two years. They may change that next month, but as of May, there may, when you go down the survey, uh, if you look at street economists, none of them predict negative quarters and stuff. And so, but if they get it wrong, and it was, you know, at the end of the day, with this much money on the sidelines and stuff like that, and, and the market's already reacted to the rate, they've already priced the 10-year up, even though it's come back down. You know, it, a lot of the adjustments are being made, and so, you know, that's going to be, you know, so it, it'll, be, it'll be shallow. Whereas, but the reality is the rate structure has to move. Why? The economy is bigger than it was in 2019. The unemployment rate's lower. The, the, the projected growth for this year is actually stronger than the projected growth was for 20 before the pandemic. Why wouldn't the rate structure be at least the same? And they've got to put it up to normalize that. And when you do that, then you don't have false growth, any inflationary growth. So I think that that's a good thing. So I think as you think about it, they have to slow down the economy. It will go below trend. If it goes into recession, the way we run the right, the way we've driven responsible growth for the last decade plus, you know, we, we stress test it every quarter. We know what a 10% unemployment looks like. You see it in the stress test. You'll see the results here in a few weeks, I think. And, you know, you'll see it. And it shows we have the capital liquidity. And by the way, the whole industry does. And that's a good thing. That is a good thing. So when you talk, a lot of CEOs and executives and global leaders come to you for advice. When you talk to them now, how concerned are they? Are they about an economic slowdown? What's that? What, the, what, what do you hear in their voice? The, so the the challenge for certain people is is you know they're they're having inflationary pressures and they tried to hold price, mm -hmm. um, and therefore they got pinched on margins and you saw that come out. But that that'll adjust its way through. The interesting thing is a little phenomenon going on earlier in the year and late last year was a lot of people got people from higher inflation economies to come work in the U.S. and say, you have to move on price, you have to get your balance back. If your inputs are going up, your outputs have to go up. Now. The scarcity that was driving this is also a different measure. So people can't get they can't get stuff. So if you have a parts manufacturer, you know you're willing to pay to get the raw materials to get that part out because you know it's going to be it's already forward sold. Backlogs are huge 
you know, I've talked to a company that makes uh, parts for golf carts, and their book through December, the fellow said, every piece of plastic they didn't get home to make the golf cart piece, they grab it, whatever the price, they'll pass through the price. I have been playing a lot of rounds. That's different, but that's different from somebody else who can't pass through the price. So it's a different, little different outcome, CEO by CEO, company by company, business model, of how easy it is to pass through that price. The, the reality is these, these supply shortages have to get normalized for the economy to normalize, and we thought that'd be over by now. It's still difficult, and that's another one that we have to worry about. But, you know, it ebbed a lot, got a little worse, got a little better. So that is something I think the governments of the world have to really get done, which is get those things restarted. What we're seeing in the markets right now is, is a market that I don't think a lot of people have seen before. You've seen pretty much everything. Do you think that feeds back into how consumers spend and hits their, it is hitting their wealth. Do you yeah. think they go and cut back on their spending? So in the, a lot of people talk about zero trading and you know, digital brokers and stuff. In, in, the, in the 90s, we had sure trade and all these companies and I had them. And, if you looked at the Michigan Conference numbers and trading volumes and retail, they ran together. Now, is that which causes which is an interesting question. So the reality is when consumers, you know, the, the market's up and they're feeling good, you know, they've trade more. When the market comes down, they trade less. So as, as consumers will adjust to the fact that the wealth effect of their homes, the wealth effect of, of their things. The reality is they're still up a lot from, you know, sort of the, if you take 19 as a baseline and you look at, you know, prices of real estate is still up a lot. You know, so it'll come down or flatten out the new homes or whatever the sales are today were down a little bit. That's all, that's the expected outcome the Fed has to achieve to slow things down. So yeah, they'll they'll adjust and that's been true for 25 years of having this business. Zero dollar trades are not a new concept. We did in 19, 2006 or seven and had buses around. These are not new <laughs> concepts. You, you know, applied differently, talked about differently. The reality is if people feel wealthier, they spend more. The wealth effect affects a broader base of consumers and most economists know because of the 401ks and other translations. Now interesting as a stock market adjusts now that was using compensation, that creates an interesting dynamic because people got paid in stock, I get paid all but my base salary in stock and it's worth less but that's not really relevant. But if you think about an average employee at a technology firm this downdraft, that creates some pressure on them and that'll be interesting to see them adjust to that.